with the mask on the whole time? Like, you're breathing from the masks the whole once you enter, or what? I mean, you're you're putting you put those on. I can't answer that without my attorney present. <laughs> Kev, Kev's my attorney. All right. <laughs> We go home, John. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. No. This is a battery. This flashes. Oh, it's dope. It's amazing. Listen, be careful. So nobody sends you. It's time to go sledding down the hill. This thing's alright, it's not bad. Better than that styrofoam thing we had, I'll tell you that. Better than the sled. Yeah. It's a better than the sled. It's attached to this piece of back here. You're going to pull me out of it. I, I was holding pulling it wall. You came right up. See the anchor? The whole thing is if you fall in through the ice, you're going to fall down the ice. Looking at a sea anchor. Guy who's out here has to be able to pull them. That's what that's supposed to do is keep you up. Well, whether yeah. you can or whether you can grab the bars. Yeah, you know, you're yourself. a shelf extraordinaire. Yeah. <laughs> Not that, but even lower. Is this tagline back there? Yeah, it's a heaving line. We have full control and we know when we go through. Right this feet stairway up on right top here. Of the How about this stairway? This is like a stairway, doesn't it? It is a stairway. Is there access to the other building? I don't remember having access going all the way back that far from here. Let's find out where they're going. Let's get to activate the help team.
how that fed back. Sandwiches out, but I don't know if he's, he's captain said something this morning. He wants to uh, give uh, everybody some more time behind the wheel. He might just have Mark just drive around for a little while, you know, just drive around for the next 15 20 minutes. So, yeah. Yeah. Are you I am a chauffeur, I've only driven here once, and I had it. Uh, I've driven actually, I drove rescue five a couple times on details. I get there and say, I need a chauffeur. I happen to be one, but for the most part, I'd be like the, the fourth string, you know, chauffeur here. So very rare would I ever have to drive. And the one time I did drive, there was another chauffeur, not a regular one, but a 
a backup or whatever, but the lieutenant had me drive. Yeah. I don't know the borough nearly as well as, as everybody else. I know, I can figure out general directions. If I hear a company, being a buff that I am, you know, I can, okay, I know that's down that way or down that way, but as far as the, the streets go, I'd, be, I'd just be circling, trying to find a column of smoke. Totally, totally zeroing in on it. Let me tell you, if you had, if you had the bumper can this morning, we were going on a run. Every, you know, everybody's getting out of the way. The only people who don't get out of the way are pedestrians. They see you coming, and they, they're like, now! You know, they, they run in front of the ring. They try and beat you. They can't wait for three seconds for you to pass. And they see you coming. They, like, time it. He's not close enough yet. Uh, now he's close enough. And then they run out in the street. And there's one guy, I swear to God, I thought we were going to hit him. Uh, you know, that's what... Drive is one thing, but being the officer up there, I go home with a heart attack every day. You know, you have no control. You have absolutely no control. And uh, I can see. I can watch. Oh, look at the, I was in the same spot last night. I'm looking out the window. And I see the guy looking right at us. Cars are all moving. And he runs. And yeah. he stopped. And he ran back. If he would have went, he'd be, he'd be part of the apparatus right now. But I don't know what they're thinking. The best of it, like the baby strollers. You know, the, the, that's like... That's like the, the, they push a baby stroller in front. You know, how many times you see people cross the street? They, they walk out between cars, but first you see a stroller. And then you see the, the, the parent from walking out. It's, uh, it's tragic, actually. It's a big red one, But this is, this is just a uh, boards. You know, uh, Splints. Back, uh, Splints. Okay. Mostly our first aid stuff. Yeah. This is the most important thing. Okay. The antidote. For, uh, I, so I don't know what it is. It's some sort of super secret stuff. But it's, you know, a hazmat. It's so a hazmat thing. It's a, uh, that's the antidote for whatever. You know. There's a couple uh, kids in there, right, stick, stick kids. I think there's six. Every once in a while they give us a new one. You know, they, they expire after a certain while. It's for like biological, like, warfare. Germ warfare. Ter terrorist act, you know, stuff like that. New York, September 11, 2001. The images still burn like the fire. As you walked up the street, it was, it was dark. It was nighttime in the middle of the day. There, there were fire trucks on fire. There was engines on fire. There was police cars that were tossed around like they were potato chips. That day, in one hour, the New York Fire Department lost more men than in the past 50 years. Hardest hit, the elite rescue companies. Every member on duty was lost. I knew a large number of members were going to be dead. I knew that a large number of civilians were going to be dead. I just didn't think it was going to be all my guys. But there's another story still untold a tale of life not death in the months before september 11th we were invited to ride along with the men of rescue one and two to follow them into action this is their story a tale of brotherhood and remembrance of the men who are all to their brethren, still riding. I'm go to work again. They're called the Firemen's Firemen, the rescue companies, the special forces of the New York Fire Department. Every fireman responds to alarms, but these men are different. 
Each is a veteran, each hand-picked. And when the worst emergencies come along, these guys get the call. In the months before 9-11, their story was just beginning. Well, no, we'll be there in a few seconds. On this window. Fly seems to be extending, uh, getting away. In a job where each day brings new risks, firefighters prize what they call being aggressive. In the Flatbush section of Brooklyn, a five-alarm fire is blazing. A van parked between two houses has ignited. The flames have spread to both homes. And once again, Make the move. Rescue 2 steps into the inferno. An easy way to describe it, close your eyes, turn the oven on to about 500 degrees, wait till it warms up, and then open the oven. The blast of heat that you feel is really our work environment. Everything up there is plywood. This entire rat is plywood. You gotta find a stand going up to the attic. You're in unfamiliar territory. You really don't know what you're in because it's not your house. It's not your apartment. You might be getting somebody trapped in the rear, and uh, you gotta get to the rear. But it's sort of like going into a maze because, you know, where is the rear? You get tunnel vision. Things start narrowing in. That your mark? You're just concentrating. Everything is narrowed down to what's going on between your two hands. An unchecked fire doubles in intensity every 30 seconds until there's nothing left to burn. In a wood frame building, that doesn't leave much time. You know, you try to stay calm and, and use your head and use your instincts. Your heart's pumping and your mind's racing. Is there a floor to share? And the adrenaline's going on top of everything else. Your back might have been hurting 20 minutes before, but right now, you, you can lift 400 pounds. How hot is it? Is it getting hotter? You know, that's telling you something. You hear it crackling, okay, you know, it's, it's over here, as opposed to hearing, you know, a roaring sound like a train coming, uh-oh. Once a fire reaches the top of the house, it can jump to the adjoining buildings and engulf the whole block. The rescue team never talks about fear or courage. They just talk about things getting warm. I think most firefighters don't like the word scary, but yeah, it's scary as hell. With the plywood attic burning out of control, the men are pinned down in the hallway below. If I'm on the fire floor, there's another guy that I know is there. He might not be next to me, he's not holding my hand, he's doing his job also, but in this company, you're never alone. All right, 10 feet on top, but it's you and your backup man. Everybody else off the stairs, okay? Make sure you let them know now. It's you and your backup man. Up the stairs in the attic, the fire has just gotten much worse. Hey, uh, who's that right there standing up? Rescue. Every fireman faces a moment of danger. For Kevin O'Rourke, it's about to come here. Need a hand on top, Richard? Uh, even though you couldn't see him, you can picture the smile on his face from ear to ear. <laughs> he'd be bouncing around in there like a little kid, you know, and like I said, he'd bump into somebody, oh, excuse me, you know, pardon me. Excuse me, Chief, thank you. God, guys. You know, it's not the way it's always verbalized inside a burning building. Kevin notices the floor is beginning to give way. A lot of holes here, brother. Just as he warns the others, <laughs> he falls through. He dangles above the fire. Fortunately, his brothers are there to lift him out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For the men of the rescue companies, there is a fine line between bravery and survival. The trickiest question is always when to leave. It's hard to tell a fireman it's time to go. It means that you quit, you gave up, and you don't want it. It's your responsibility to make sure, as a captain, that they're not risking their lives for naught. But this time out, Captain Ruvalo will take that risk. 
he decides it's not quite time to go. Hey, bring the line in now! Rescue 2 makes one last push, breaking through into the attic to confront the blaze. Good job, son, good job. The top of the house is burned down to the timbers when the water finally does its job. It's taken hours, but they've saved the block and Kevin, too. You all right? Yeah. yeah. Sure? You sure? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking for oh. oh, you know, kid, it just kept crumbling around me. No, I never see you really talk about the fear. You joke about the fear. You joke about what you do. You joke about, you know, uh, whew that one this time uh it was interesting uh the floor gave way uh on the second floor and i ended up stepping into the hole and it just kept getting bigger i ended up uh spread eagle holding on to the beams you know until uh, the brothers were kind enough to pull me uh over onto the solid floor so now he knew i said as long as i swing down you know i'm only going to be like four or five feet off right. the floor to, you know to drop just to drop down if i had to right. Luckily, I didn't have to. <laughs> a brother to each other. It's proved to you on a daily basis, and you prove it to the other guys on a daily basis that I can be trusted with your life, and I trust mine to you. These guys are going to die for me if they have to. They can, one way or another, they're coming for me. We don't always like each other, but there is a love there, and it's always going to be there. I mean, if you're willing to risk your life for another man, you better love him a little bit. At 8.48 a.m. on September 11, 2001, an alarm was sounded for Box 8087, the World Trade Center. Eleven men responded from Rescue 1, seven from Rescue 2, and what they saw was unreal. From our quarters, if you look, you, you used to be able to see the towers. I'm sure as the door went up and they pulled out of quarters, they got a good look. You know, they had a good idea of the conditions there at that time, the first building that was hit. They had extra guys right that morning. Unfortunately, the job came in at the change of tours. So not only do we have the night tour, but we had the day tour as well. Realizing the significance of the alarm, I think everybody that was in the firehouse just ran and jumped on the truck. You got a full truckload of people racing down to that site because every, all, all firefighters wait for the big one. And that was one of the big ones, not realizing what was going to happen later, but the significance of the amount of people that were trapped and what you could do to try to save them. You just go. You go because you know you're supposed to go and you know that that's what you know how to do. This is the Super Bowl fire. This is, this is the big one. They responded through the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. To the World Trade Center. They were able to get out of the tunnel and pull up onto West Street. And when they made that turn, you know, they saw the tower burning the way it was. But one of the commissioners who was responding in through the tunnel walked up with them to the building. She's told us that the guys were, you know, joking around, you know, laughing, giggling, even though you might be busting each other's chops. The seriousness of the situation was obviously in every guy's mind. And they hit the stairs and they just started going up. You know, they were bent on getting to that fire floor. I knew they had a real good fire. And I thought that that's all it was going to be. Just a real good fire. And one of those things that they were going to talk about you know, for years to come. Oh, I was at the big one, the World Trade Center, when the plane hit. And as I watched and the second plane hit, I realized this was an act of terrorism. And I took off, as I think just about every other fireman in the city did. He saw across the bottom of the screen, said, breaking news and big, thick, black billowing smoke and it said lower Manhattan. I said, oh, look at that, the brothers got a good job. And then it panned out and I saw the World Trade Center. And 
I got probably one of the sickest feelings I've ever gotten in my life. I saw the, the amount of fire and, and the, what was going on, and I just said to myself, oh, my God. Inside the towers, the rescue teams were heading up to pump water on the fire. They were going to be on a fire floor. They had been there for quite a significant amount of time already. So it would have been a hard climb, but they would have made it. They'd be on the fire floor fighting fire. And I was trying to judge from my position how many floors of fire that they were faced with. And I was just shaking my head at the enormity of the whole thing. There were upwards of 35,000 people in those buildings when the first plane hit. They were heading up, you know, to make sure that that fire went out. We have to go in there. We have to get those people out. We're firemen. Can't stand outside and say, wow, that looks really bad. I say it with nothing but pride in my voice. I mean, I know where they were going. And everybody here knows where they were going. And uh, that's the way I only can say, when is it, when, when is it time to leave? It, it just isn't for us. As long as there's a fireman in that building, we're not leaving. It's the rescue's mission. And, uh, and we're going to live it. I mean, and, and, and that's it, at any cost. And unfortunately, you know, it was the greatest cost that time. Back at the firehouses, the off-duty men from Rescue 1 and 2 began pouring in. Bobby Gallion was here first, then me, and then guys just started coming. And we understood the magnitude of what was going on. We were well aware that one building had already come down. Human nature is that you're going to turn around and uh, you're getting out of that building, man. The other building's down. It's just a matter of time for you. When yours is coming down, you already know the other building's down. It's not a secret. Um, they never turned around. And if you're ever going to get scared, yeah. You know what? That's total fear right there. But you also know that you signed on for this deal. You know what I mean? There's firemen in trouble, and you're going. And you hope for the best, but you keep climbing. Chief Downey was there. Special Operations. I remember saying to Chief, uh, you know, I know you're really busy, but we're here. We've got three guys from Rescue One here. If there's anything we can do for you immediately. And uh, he just shook his head and he says, uh, right now we think we're missing about 200 guys. So I want you to stand on that corner right there. And as soon as I can use him, I'm going to put you to work. He just walked off into the cloud. You know, it was very calm, cool, and collected as he always was. At I don't know if it's ever been to an operation like this, but he uh, went off. He said he would come back for us, and uh, he never came back. Those chiefs, uh, they didn't leave. They had men in the building, and they wouldn't leave without them. And they had time to get out, but they wouldn't leave their men. The rest of the off-duty men hurried to the World Trade Center any way they could. We were able to commandeer a city bus that happened to be riding down the block. The, the bus driver was good enough to ask the other passengers on the bus to get off, and she got us to within a block and a half of the Trade Center. And on the way, the, the building collapsed. Everybody wants. As you walked up the street, it was, it was dark. It was nighttime in the middle of the day. There was dust, there was smoke. Uh, it, it was difficult to breathe two blocks away. And as you worked your way towards West Street, it was out of the movies. It was, this was a movie set. This couldn't be for real. There were fire trucks on fire. There was engines on fire. There was police cars that were tossed around like they were potato chips. There was ambulances that were crushed. The private cars flattened like pancakes. And this is just still two blocks out. And, and just buildings on fire all over the place. It just, there's nothing that you've ever done in your life that could prepare you for what you saw when you turned the corner and actually got a look at what was there or what wasn't there. I had hooked up with uh, Captain Ruvalo and members of Rescue 2 
and we tried for, I'd say, close to an hour to find different ways to get to where we thought they might be. There were voids that we looked, and before we went in, we may have said like a quick silent prayer, like, God, this doesn't look good. Let me get out of there. Give me the strength. We're all moving in different directions, uh, trying to find the good void, you know, where the guys were, who was trapped. Quite a few has found a void by the hotel. And when we went into this void, we found a helmet, we found uh, a handy talkie, a hook. And the hook looked like a, res a rescue two hook. And then I heard Captain Ruvalo on the radio, and I said, Cap, are all our guys accounted for? And there was a long pause and just a no. After September 11th, the lives were counted. In all, firefighters helped save some 30,000 civilians, but 343 of their own men were lost. You were at the mercy of the group chart that day. Anything can happen on any given day. I think the guys that were lost were heroes, but they were heroes before that. They're heroes because of what they did when they lived. They weren't heroes because of the World Trade Center. They were heroes because they stood in front of the mayor and put their right hand up and said they'd be a firefighter. I lost 23 years' worth of best friends. The guys I was at their wedding with. The guys I broke in with. The guys I shared laughs with in the back room. John was probably the, uh, my first probie, so to speak, coming into the rescue. Uh, someone that I, uh, I took a personal interest in, in training. And I was very, uh, very tough on him. And he uh, consistently rose to the occasion. Let's say we go home, John. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. John had no flaws. That's why he was the good son. The good son. Oh, the good son is back. He would have been uh, my choice to replace me. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the firefighters tried to make sense of what had happened, to reclaim their dead and start again. We got a phone call on the rig that they had uncovered one of our masks and that they were digging further, but maybe we should get down there. So we, we shot in and uh, I was parking the rig, the guys took off. By the time I got up there, they, uh, they had already uncovered Lincoln, put him in a, in a Stokes basket, and they, uh, they had him covered with a flag. And we carried him out. We went back in, and in the same area we were fortunate that we were able to find Kevin. Took a while to free him up. Same thing, got him into a Stokes, covered him with a flag. Minister, priest, I'm not sure which it was, but it was, it was a man of the cloth, gave a blessing, and we, uh, we were able to bring them home. Void, man. It really is. It's uh, it's big emptiness. 
the first couple weeks, it was a lot of times when you got back here to the firehouse, you really wanted to like contemplate why you were doing what we were doing, you know? Why did I choose to do this? And then you sit down and read five or ten cards from some first graders, you know, with all the great misspelled words, but you get the drift of what they were trying to tell you, or all the pictures, all the thoughts. There's still the little boy in each guy here, even though we've been through this great tragedy. And you find yourself telling a little joke, <laughs> laughing a little. You know, it's, it's starting. It's starting to come back. The healing process has probably already started. On the riding list on the chart, we have who's, uh, so we know who's on duty. And it says still riding because um, we have members of this company we haven't found yet. And as far as we're concerned, they're, they're still responding. Still riding is, is, is a show of respect to the guys that they're still, their spirits are still, and will always continue to ride with us every time we go out the door. But I think what keeps us going is the fact there's still fires, there's still emergencies, there's still a lot of people out there need help. And so, each day, they head out again. The men of Rescue 1 and 2, still riding. Thank you.